All right, Alexander, let's talk about the uh, prisoner exchange, Brittany Griner for Victor Bout. Uh, this is an interesting story, and I think there's a lot more going on here than what uh, many analysts are are portraying. Uh, if you're if you're on the on the Democrat Party Biden side of things, or you're you've got that kind of woke ideology, you're cheering, you're super happy. Uh, if you're not, then you're super upset, and you know uh, Putin once again, the masterful chess player Putin has taken Biden for a ride, and uh, oh my God, the the Biden White House has released the Merchant of Death, and uh, all we've got for it is a basketball player. Uh, that's kind of the the narrative there. By the way, uh, I was doing some research on this, the Merchant of Death. Uh, little little moniker that they've placed on Bout was actually UK made. It was, I believe it was a UK Intel and UK courts that branded him the merchant of death. And then of course, yes. Hollywood yes. kicked in and they got the movies going yeah. And, yeah. and all of this narrative was built up mm. around Bout. And I think they, they make him to be this much bigger, colossal figure than what we're really dealing with here. I'm not saying he's a good guy. I'm just saying that he's been built up to something much greater than uh, than what's going on. But but anyway, um, my quick take on this, Alexander, is that, uh, look, the Biden White House, they got it. They had a choice. They chose Griner over Whelan. I don't think it's a surprise that they would make that choice. This is a political decision. And uh, and the um, the Russians, they got bout back. Yeah. And I think that everyone that's talking about Putin got his weapons merchant back and this guy was a GRU officer or this guy was pushing weapons for Russia. I personally, I think that's all nonsense. Maybe it's true. Maybe it's not. I personally think that the reason Russia wanted Bout back is because you can't have Russian nationals, no matter how bad they are, you can't have them being arrested in other countries and extradited to the United States. I think that for a country like Russia, it's unacceptable to have that. If this guy is guilty of whatever he's guilty of, then the Russians would prefer the United States to work with them and he can be tried in, the, in, in Russia under Russian law. But for the Russians to have this narrative that their nationals could be in other countries and just grabbed and extradited to the United States, I think for the uh, for the Kremlin, it's it, it, it's a picture that they can't have out there, and and that's Absolutely. I think the the underlying motivation for the Russians mm. to get Bout back. That's why they want him back because they can't have this 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 narrative out there, this sense that if I'm Russian and I travel and I'm in Thailand or wherever. The U.S. can just come one day and grab me, even if I've done terrible things, even if I'm innocent, who knows? They can just grab me and whisk me away to the United States. It reminds me of a certain journalist who was also who's also trying to be extradited to the United States and is not a U.S. citizen. There are parallels there. And, and for the Russians, they said, no, this is unacceptable. They played the long game. In 2018, they got Whelan. The U.S. wasn't ready to trade out for Whelan, and Brittany Griner fell in their lap. And she did plead guilty, and she did break the law. Punishment was probably excessive, definitely excessive. Did the Russians capitalize on the fact that Griner fell into their, into their lap at the Moscow airport? Sure. But they had two. The U.S. had one. They gave Biden a choice, and he chose Absolutely. I, I, I think you're entirely right on every point, by the way. And I think you're absolutely correct about the Russians being absolutely furious. I remember it. I remember when Bout was you know, arrested in Thailand and when he was extradited to the US. And the fact, by the way, that the extradition process in Thailand was basically, I mean, it was... I mean, it was barely an extradition process at all. It was done in an extraordinarily, um, you know, shortened way. I'll just say a few things about that. Now, I think to say, I'm going to say this, I completely agree with you. 
I mean, this att attempt to present him as some kind of, you know, big, high-flying, merchant of death, lord of war, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, giant arms dealer. He's a big player. He's, he'd served in the Soviet military. He's, I'm pretty sure he did have some kind of intelligence background, but, you know, not on any, you know, humongous scale. Um, in the 1990s, everything in Russia, everything that the Soviet Union did was basically falling apart. It was easy to cobble together airlines. I suspect there was probably a lot of people quietly involved and Bolt was some kind of big person. And they were doing their little bit of trading and arms dealing in, in Africa and Asia and all that kind of thing. But it was on a microscopic scale when you look at you know who is really supplying the arms today i mean you know i was just reading just you know the other day about the fact that 20 billion dollars of arms to ukraine apparently can't be completely or fully accounted for i mean what what boat was doing it's just i mean it's just peanuts now 80 billion other, in afghanistan that was just left billion behind, in the the Taliban. Left behind exactly i mean you know i mean I mean, to, to even talk, to even compare the two is, is, is risable. And on top of everything else, I mean, you know, when, he, when you have films like War, Lord of War, articles about him being the merchant of death and all of that being circulated for years upon years, you know, before he's brought to the US and brought to the US in this extraordinary way. Well, I have to say this. I mean, I'm not, you know here i'm not his advocate no doubt he's done some bad things but it's impossible for someone like him to have a fair trial and he certainly didn't get a fair trial in the u.s because the well had already been poisoned i mean everybody the judge the attorneys presumably the jury they'd all probably by now by now already had their views about bolt made up for them before he actually went was brought to the US and he was brought to the US in a way that was so extraordinary that in itself it would have damaged his chances it seems to me of getting a fair trial there so anyway that's all I'm going to say about Bolt but the fact is from a Russian point of view there were two reasons I think why they wanted him back the first one the big one and I remember, I remember reading all the commentaries in the Russian media at the time when he was arrested in Thailand. The big one was the one you said. The US claims this global jurisdiction, this extraterritorial jurisdiction for its courts, anybody, anywhere, uh, from whichever country is, you know, sus is susceptible to being seized, grabbed by the US somewhere, wherever that place may be, uh, Thailand in this case, and of course the Russians, who still conceive of themselves as a great power, but who are also an adversary of the US, they're going to oppose that. They're going to say, you know, if you're going to start seizing our people, we're going to start seizing yours, and we're going to play really tough games with you um, until we get our people back, and you're going to stop doing this because... Two can play at this game. It's unacceptable. We're not going to have it. We're, if, if it means, you know, arresting your basketball players, your you know, important, you know, celebrated basketball players. And, I'm, and I have to say, Griner ticks all the boxes. <laughs> I don't want to go through what those boxes are, but from a Democrat woke point of view, she ticks all the boxes. Um, I mean, so, I mean, you know, they, they, they knew who they were going for. Let's put it like this from a Russian point of view. They will do it. The other reason I think why they made a particular point about Bout is because after all the things that have been said about Bout, he was the most difficult person to bring back to Russia. So by forcing the Americans to trade him, they're signaling to all the other people that, you know, the Kremlin is going to look after you. We're going to play this chess game until we get all our pieces back. And this is not the end. This is the beginning. Because if we can get Bolt back, we're going, we're going to come 
and we're going to get you back too. So, I, I you know, I, I think this was this was their, the reason for their strategy. The overriding reason is the one that you said. We are not going to let have a situation in the world where our people are just seized by the US whenever it wants, however it wants. We're going to draw a line. If the US take, does this, we're going to play the same game against the US and we're going to show the US that you know they can't win these battles. And secondly, by getting bolt back, they're teaching the US how tough and how strong they are, how they'll hold out until they get what they want, which is Bolt, who, as I said, was perhaps the most notorious prisoner, Russian prisoner in American prisons. Yeah, okay, so let's get to the geopolitical reasons, because while this prisoner exchange is an interesting story, and obviously the the foreign ministry of Russia, the State Department, they were talking about this prisoner exchange and they were negotiating about this prisoner exchange for months. This has been revealed that they were in these negotiations for months. There's a couple of geopolitical things that uh, that this shows. The first thing is that this exchange does provide a type of cover, a cover story for the U.S. and for Russia to discuss other things. Because if if... If the United States were to say, well, we're negotiating with Russia on Ukraine, well, then the media and the neocons, they would just go crazy. No, you can't do this. How can you dare negotiate with Putin, the, the dictator? So for the United States to say we're speaking with Russia on behalf of Brittany Griner, well, then that's that's perfectly fine. We we say go. We applaud that. So it does provide a cover for them to, to engage in some sort of diplomacy. And that's a good thing, the fact that the U.S. and, and Russia are talking uh, Blinken made a statement along those lines that things are tough, but we, we have shown that we can come to an agreement. The interesting point about this is that this is the same Blinken who is also trying to make Russia a state sponsor of terror, like what the EU parliament did. Now, if you brand Russia a state sponsor of terrorism, Brittany Griner is in Russia for nine years. Whelan is in Russia for, for however long he's going to be in there because you're not going to be able to negotiate with Russia on these types of things. And it kind of um, exposes the stupidity of the EU parliament by branding Russia a state sponsor of terrorism. It exposes the stupidity of people like Blinken who sit there and push to make Russia a state sponsor of terror or a Congress who want to make Russia a state sponsor of terrorism. You do that and you're not going to be able to have dialogue with Russia anymore on matters like prisoner exchanges or uh, or arms treaties or anything, stuff like that, terrorism, whatever. So that's the first thing. The second uh, thing that I want to ask you about is the uh, the story that no one is talking about, and that is the Saudi MBS involvement, MBS and the UAE, but Saudi Arabia and MBS, they were the mediators. Here's what I think happened. I think that um, the Russians did MBS a favor. MBS said, put me in as mediator. The Russians said, great, we'll package you into this deal. U.S. courts drop your charges against uh, MBS with uh, Khashoggi, drop all those charges. Biden has to drop those charges. MBS becomes a mediator. He's a negotiator. He's legitimized in the eyes of the world. Saudi Arabia now looks at Russia and says, hey, you guys, you really did me a, a great favor by including me in all of this. I'll get you guys back next time. It worked out really well for Putin and, and MBS. Absolutely. And by the way, they've done this before. I mean, the um, um, Russians have said that MBS was the negotiator of another deal, which was involved, uh, uh, you know, this kind of exchange deal whereby um, British prisoners, if you remember, were released to Britain and MBS was the mediator there. So the Russians are, are, are doing MBS lots of favours. And I think you're absolutely right. There's been a lot of speculation about why uh, Biden, you know, said that there would be no charges against MBS over Khashoggi. I have no doubt you're right that all of this was combined and linked together. So, yes, the Russians are working with the, with MBS. This, of course, and we've done a program about this at a time when MBS is receiving Xi Jinping of China. It just tells you again who understands how to work these things, 
how to make MBS a friend, how to make him important, and of course, it, it, and how to you know get MBS favors, and of course, MBS returns the favors. He's going to return the favors to the Russians. He's going to work with the Chinese. He's going to do all sorts of things. But he comes out looking good and strong. And that's what the Russians like. And that's what the Russians want. Because he's going to have warm feelings to them. And that's, of course, in their interests. Because, of course, they're the big oil producers and oil exporters. And, of course, the Russians have this little matter of this oil price cap to worry about. And MBS is going to be on side with them on that. So that's absolutely right. That is completely correct. Now, let's unpack all the other things you said about the fact that there is now a, a dialogue. There's a channel of communication between Moscow and Washington talking about these um, prisoners, these people and these exchanges. Now, about two, three weeks ago, um, William Burns, the director of the CIA, and Sergei Narishkin, the head of Russia's intelligence agency, the SVR, meet in Ankara. The official word in Washington is that it was partly to discuss arms control. The Russians have put all discussions of arms control in the freezer. They say we can't really move forward with that until everything else in our relationship, including Ukraine, is sorted out. The other thing the US said was that they were talking about the prisoner exchanges, about Brittany Griner, about David Whelan, about all of those things. They did not talk. This is the official US position. It was not about Ukraine. They weren't going to discuss Ukraine because, as you rightly said, the official US position is that no talks about Ukraine without Ukraine. Ukraine has to be there. Well, Narishkin goes back to Moscow a few weeks later, about a couple of days later, he gives an interview. He said, well, actually, most of our discussion was about Ukraine. The subjects, Ukraine, Kiev regime, were amongst the words that were most often brought up. So this is a mechanism whereby the US does talk about its relationship with the Russians. And of course, there's still American prisoners in Russian jails. David Whelan is still there. As you correctly said at the start of the program, there's many angry people in the US because they feel that, you know, Griner, who, as you correctly said, pleaded guilty. So she, you know, one assumes she committed the crime. She's not denied that. Um, she's now been released. Whelan, who's never pleaded guilty, who protests his innocence, who's somebody with a record of loyalty to the U.S. and service to the U.S., he's still there in, an, in a Russian prison. And, I mean, so Blinken, the U.S., are obliged to continue discussions about Whelan and about all of the others, even if they didn't want to. But, of course, they do want to, because contrary to this EU idea of, you know, branding Russia a terrorist state. The US has, in the end, to talk to Russia. They've got to talk to Russia about all kinds of things, including, of course, ultimately, Ukraine. But you see what Blinken is up to, because he's now made a speech, and he's gone from one cliché, we won't talk about Ukraine without Ukraine, except, of course, we are. But he's now his latest cliché is that you know, we disagree with the Russians on lots of things, but we want to move forward together on those things which are in our own interest. So America will talk to Russia about those things it cares about. It won't talk to Russia about the things that Russia cares about. The Russians have said, no way. We're not prepared to do that. We're not prepared to talk about arms control, for example, whilst you continue to observe that kind of stand. So we're going to just talk about our full spectrum relationship, every problem that exists between us, as we showed that we're going to do when we met in Ankara. So you can see the muddle, in a way, that US diplomacy is in. They have to talk to the Russians. They need to talk to the Russians. The sanctions war against the Russians hasn't worked. The oil price cap isn't going to work. 
the war in Ukraine is not going well. They have to talk to the Russians, but at the same time, it's very, very difficult from them for them to get to escape the ideological and rhetorical trap that they work themselves into. And in the meantime, the Russians are able to play their various cards, and they've just played their grinder card with great skill. So we always say that the the uh, collective West, the neocons, they have no reverse gear. And we've been hearing over the past couple of weeks this this ramp up to, to brand Russia state sponsor of terror. What happens if they do such a thing with regards to the remaining prisoners? Say Wheeland, for example. Does that essentially mean that it's over? I mean, yes, I think, I there's think going it to be does. No more, no more dealing with, with these guys? Absolutely. I think that's exactly what it means. I think from a Russian point of view, if the U.S. goes to those lengths, if it starts using, manipulating the U.N. to try and set up tribunals, far from certain it's going to happen, by the way, but this is the talk, this is the narrative, there's even a resolution, apparently, that's going to be that's in the process of being prepared and which will be put to the General Assembly. That's the talk, but we don't yet know what's going to be in this resolution. If all this is true then eventually, if the dialogue completely collapses, all those people remain indefinitely in Russian jails, including people like Reiner. And, of course, the Russians will find others. I mean, it's, they're not... The US mustn't make the mistake of thinking that it's only they who can go around the world and start arresting people. The Russians can do the same. They've got presence in most places around the world. They can find ways of getting hold of people, too. If, if that's the kind of game that has to be played from now on. But I think that's an important distinction to wrap up the video with this story that no one is, is touching upon. And that is that Bout, whatever you may think of him, he could be the nastiest guy in the world. The fact that he was in another country and the U.S., the, some sting operation from, from what I understand that they set up, they grabbed him from Thailand and flew him back to the U.S. While in both cases of Whelan and Greiner, they were in Moscow. They were yes. in Russia. And actually, yes. as, from what I understand, it wasn't even their first trips for both Whelan and Greiner. Greiner was going almost every year. So not only were did the Russians apprehend them, once again, you may say they they had a sting operation against Whelan or or... Griner was it was it wasn't right to to imprison her either. But the fact that they traveled to Russia and Russia yes. grabbed them, I think there's that's an important distinction. Russia didn't go to yeah. another country and then fly them back to Russia yeah. and try them. I, I think that's yeah. important. That's an important Absolute. detail to this story that no one wants to talk about. Absolutely, absolutely. At the for the moment, the Russians are sticking by the legal the legal proprieties. I mean, I should say something about, I mean, you know, Bolt was arrested in Thailand, but everybody who is, who has looked at the Thai, the, the legal process in Thailand can see that virtually every rule was thrown out of the book there. I mean, Thai legal procedures were just basically torn up. The US put, obviously put enormous pressure on Thailand. And of course they got, well, to the US, it was, essentially a kidnapping and can i just say something i mean the u.s has a history of this i mean there was that period you remember of extraordinary rendition it's not supposed to can to go on anymore but it, it did happen probably to some extent still does this is after um, you know 9 11 and all that they used to seize people around the world they used to put them in black sites lots of things this is not you know, speculative, it's well documented, it's openly admitted, there have been court cases in Britain about it. So the Russians have never done that, and they don't, they're not looking to do it. But if they're pushed, if they are called a state sponsor of terrorism, then I suspect they will say to the Americans, well, in that case, everything goes. I mean, you know, we, we're prepared to go as far as you, because we've no reason any longer not to. Well, up to this point, we are sticking by legal rules. 
we're only going to be you're only interested in people who travel through Russia but from the, from this point on if you go down that road of starting to call us a state sponsor of terrorism when we have been the major opponents of terrorism we fought it in the Middle East in Syria we supported Iraq we supported you in Iraq we supported you back after 9-11 in Afghanistan we fought a jihadi insurgency in the Caucasus we did all of these things if you start talking about us in that kind of way then forget about negotiations on any topic diplomatic relations between us become impossible and if you start grabbing our people, well, you know, the game has changed its rules. Yeah, I guess we'll end the video there. I was just thinking about the point that you made with, uh, <laughs> with the weapons in Ukraine. I wonder how many merchants of death the, uh, the European Union and uh, the collective West and the, e and the uh, US have made from all of the weapons pouring into Ukraine. I wonder well, how absolutely. many Victor Bouts are going to be created from all yeah. of the weapons that have been funneled. Absolutely, and I'm going to say, and I'm going to say, and I'm going to say something else. I mean, there's lots and lots and lots and lots of those victor bouts from Ukraine, from Afghanistan, and all the rest. And individually, each one of them is probably worth multiples <laughs> victor bout. I mean, victor bout. I mean, creaky old Soviet planes from the 1950s. I mean, he was flying Antonov eights. I mean. It was, early Soviet plane from the 50s, even the so even the Russians don't give it an airworthiness certificate. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I mean, I mean, as I said, he was the most minor bit player. I mean, he was, he's in no conceivable sense, any type of Lord of War or Merchant of Death. I'm not defending him. No doubt he's done some bad things, but he's done them in a squalid, sordid, minor way. I mean, he's to, to represent him as a big, important player in this business of arms dealing is ridiculous. It's just nonsensical. The biggest arms dealers are, are well, <coughs> they would laugh at Victor about for him. He's so insignificant. They probably just don't even know him. I wonder why the U.S., uh, just a final thought, I wonder why the authorities in the U.S. Uh, nabbed him. I, I wonder if he, because I've read some statements of his where he he's claimed, I guess statements, claimed statements from him, where he was uh, saying that, you know, he's a free agent pretty much. He'll sell to, to anybody and, and, and the best yeah. deal is to sell to both sides. That's yeah. where you make the best profit. You know, you Absolutely. sell to both warring parties. You know, that's where you make the most money. I wonder if he double-crossed somewhere, someone somewhere along the way or if there was other arms dealers who wanted to get him out of the picture. I don't know. I'm just curious. Well, I mean, who knows? We'll never find out. I mean, but I'm just curious. We will why never did, they, find why out. did they grab him? Why did they go up? Why did, why did they focus so much on him? It's a very good question. I mean, it's important to say he has worked for, with Western governments. I mean, he was very heavily involved with the French government in West Africa at one time. So it's entirely plausible that he's double-crossed people. I mean, this is this is that kind of a world. I, I, I'm not defending this man. I mean, he's obviously a shady uh, character. We don't even really know very much about his life, his background. We don't even know what rank he had in the Soviet military. So that tells you that we're dealing with a very shady character indeed. And obviously he trod on someone's toes probably more than once. And they said, enough's enough. We're going to pump out stories that he's the merchant of death, the lord of war. We're going to build a big narrative around him. It helps us because, again, it identifies the Russians with arms dealing. We also scare off the little players from countries like Russia. We make it absolutely clear that if you really want to buy arms, you know, illegally and surreptitiously, well, then you do so, to, you do so by contacting um, our people, not people like Bout who from the other side. But, you know, I, I, it's pointless because we're never going to find the whole truth about this. As I said, there's, there's things that have happened that we just don't really know. And I think you're quite right. If you really want the explanations, don't waste your time in America because probably he's too small a player, even for the Americans, or definitely for the Americans. I suspect 
look to London. <laughs> that was where the whole victim bout legend started. Pro the, the British themselves are involved in all kinds of things in Africa, especially. Probably there's something there. Maybe the French as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't download uh, this copyright music from uh, from these pirate services. We're going to squash these pirate services, and you have to buy, spend the ninety nine cents uh, a track to download from Apple Music and <laughs> from other. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 that, it's that, that, that's what I can see the arms dealers say. Like, yeah, yeah it's yeah. that kind of it's that kind of affair. I mean, this is what it looks like to me. Again, to repeat what uh, you just said. This is not in any way to defend this man. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's been some attempts in Russia to claim, you know, that he's an innocent and, you know, as, as you know, as innocent as, uh, you know, yeah, almost a saintly figure uh, uh, that, you know, all he was interested in was supplying, you know, humanitarian assistance to all sorts of people. Well, I don't take any of that seriously. I mean, that's nonsense. That's absolute rubbish. I mean, clearly he was up to all sorts of dodgy things. But as I said, let's not build him up into some sort of <laughs> lord of war. I mean, he was he was nothing like that. I mean, he's just, as I said, not a lord of war. He was, a you know, a serf of war. <laughs> sort of really, really low, <laughs> decent plankton in a sea full of giant sharks and predators. I mean, he was a, he was a, he was a non-entity. You, you don't get involved in that type of business being one guy. <laughs> you're no. you're going up against well, that, massive, uh, massive. Well, that's right, yeah. exactly. I mean, it, it's typical. Yeah. It's typical of the Russia of the nineties. As I said, everything was just falling yeah. apart. They were doing little things here and there, trying to keep some kind of a presence, trying to make some money. You know, <clears throat> to the ex-Soviet military. Um, Probably much of it very ugly and very nasty. But as I said, this isn't on the scale of <laughs> some of the other things that we see. As I said, I mean, you're talking about arms dealers, real ones. As I said, the, 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 the smallest one of those who made money in Afghanistan and is making money in Ukraine is going to be worth multiples of Victor Bao. I mean, it's, the, the, there's just no comparison at all. All right, we will end it there, the Duran.locals.com. We are also on Rockfin and go to the Durant shop. 10% off, use the code. Good day. Take care.